It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, either I'm speaking loudly or this mic is really strong, or is it good? Okay, it's good. Thank you. Uh, I'm enjoying Connecticut. I, I was reflecting on David's sense that, you know, your background knowledge comes flooding in when you're, when you're uh, reading, but also flooding in any time. And yesterday I came here on Route 84, and I saw Groton kind of on the map over on the right, and I thought, no, the map's wrong. It kind of should be over there on the left. Then I realized, okay, Groton, Massachusetts, Groton, Connecticut. Okay, I better get that straightened out. So then we got that straightened out, got here, and we had a very nice trip over to Mystic uh, for dinner. And I thought, this is a charming place, but it looks just like Annapolis, Maryland. And it is like Annapolis. And now I understand Mystic because I've been all through Annapolis. Then we went to dinner at the Red 64. People know the Red 64? And what is a Red 64? It's a restaurant, but what else is it? It's significant because it's a boy for sailors who are coming into port. And Red means you're going to leave the Red boys on your right as you're returning to port. And that's what we do in the Chesapeake Bay whenever we sail, so I knew what Red 64, now the number 64 implies they, the count starts in the ocean and the, the numbers go up as you get inland. So I figured 64 meant a very long line of red markers between here and, and, and the sea. So now I know, I knew what red six, where Red 64 was, so you can't stop the knowledge. It's great to be here and I'm enjoying um, all these nautical qualities of, um, of, the, of your, your space here. Now, I want to address the question of, given the deep cognition that David and Freddie were both talking about, how can we help our students absorb, participate, construct in building understanding from these complex texts using hard words, how can we get there? How, what, what else do we need to be thinking about in addition to the complexity of the goal that we're uh, trying to attain? Um, let's think about the next aspects. So what are the educational challenges? What kind of framework should we have in our heads to address these challenges? <clears throat> I'm going to propose a model for how to get to the core content disciplinary expertise and give you a little evidence that this actually is a valid model and works for students. And last, some examples. Examples of what, what it means to be supportive of students' engagement in this disciplinary literacy. So first I want to just talk about what do we mean uh, by disciplinary literacy? What do we mean literacy in subject matter? Well, I think in my, this is going to be rather brief, but I'm just saying Literacy in subject matter is a little different than literacy in literature because of the text structure. Uh, the structure itself has all these forms we've heard about, cause and effect, problem solution, so it's not plot and character. And this, for many students, this is a sea change because they've grown up on plot and character. And we find many, many texts have what I'll call the pyramid structure. So there's a big idea there. Freddie showed passages in journal articles, magazine articles, bird nests. Okay, so there's a pyramid structure talking about nests. Nests are going to be the top of this pyramid. Then there's going to be what makes the nests. Who builds nests? What are nests composed of? It's going to be a pyramid you can compose. It's going to capture many of the texts that we see in content. Now, what about the kids' processing of that? One of the things that writers talk about who look at disciplinary is contextualization. So in history in particular, are you reading this text from the viewpoint uh, of a certain geographical or political or cultural perspective? What's your context for reading a letter? What's your context for reading a, a, a legal document? So there are some distinct qualities of disciplinary texts. And one of the things we want to do is to keep those in mind. Now, at the same time that you're 
into the disciplinary reading, I'm just giving you a list here of some of the things that students are doing to be making sense of a history book or a science book that are a little different than to be making sense of a story. So for example, inferencing is happening all the time. Every, at every sentence, students are connecting that sentence to what they know, that sentence to the next sentence. Because it's dense, it's complex. The story is not real easy to follow without adding things yourself. Now, inferencing is work. So this is a little bit of energy from the student. You have to know what's important. Like in this bird nest passage, what's important? The type of sticks that are used or, or how the sticks are organized. Which is the important quality of the bird nest that they're talking about here? So students are generating what's important. Uh, they are restructuring as they go continually. I'm not going to explain all these, but I just want to indicate that in the way that David and Freddie have both talked about com understanding complexity, it's the bar is raised when you come to these disciplinary texts. So the bar is raised when, you know, we're talking about literacy for them. <clears throat> so the, the core content standards have raised the bar in how tough the reading is going to be. <clears throat> My question is, how are we going to help students do this hard work that David was talking about, that Freddie was talking about? And essentially there are four motivations, four reasons for reading, four sources of empowerment that will drive kids into the processes of understanding these complicated texts. First, interest, and we're going to go into this more fully, but building students' interest in the content, helping students believe in themselves. Self-efficacy refers to confidence or belief that you can do it. Understanding that these texts about bird nests are in fact very important, very beneficial, very integral to you as a person now and you as a person in the future. Uh, and collaborating with others to comprehend and share and build knowledge. These are four drivers of the cognitive systems, so all the thinking processes David was talking about, all the vocabulary learning Freddie was talking about are being driven by the extent that students have these things. Now, in the last <clears throat> dimension of here, of engagement and motivation, we're talking about the volume. Uh, the, the, what's the biggest determinant of how students, student, how big vocabulary is? One very, very big determinant is how much students read. A, a, an article a, a week is good. An article a day is better. And so this is I indispensable to extreme, increase the volume. And I'm going to talk about the example uh, here. This is an illustration of reading habits and reading achievement in three different countries. Now, in the United States, we have here reading achievement based on, now this is for 15-year-olds, sort of who are at the end of some of their education, their, their middle school experience, and they are higher, about twice as high as students in South Africa. And I know South Africa because I visited there and they're in the survey. Now, if you look then at the Asians, the Koreans, and you can't quite say that this is an oversimplification, but they're almost three times higher in capacity to understand complicated text. So the US is right here about the average of OECD, the European countries, and the top end of them is here and the Asians are over here. They're outliers higher than we are. South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, China, top scorer in the world in, in these last international surveys. Now, what about, what else do we know? One of the things we know is the US is here in, in reading interest, reading engagement. They have indicators, how much do you read? How much do you enjoy reading? How deep is the reading that you are doing? How, you know, are you reading books or are you reading newspapers? So indicators of reading engagement have shown the US to be about here, which is the average of OECD, and we're about twice as high as South Africa, but the Asians are three times higher again. So they're, they're, going, they're doing three times more reading. 
How do we empower that? How do we help our kids become that involved, that dedicated to, to literacy and to learning through school? So that's our question. Um, <clears throat> we launched a study, a five-year study. It wasn't the first five-year study I've ever done, but it was the last five-year study uh, that I completed. And we launched it in St. Mary's County, Maryland. We began by interviewing students. 260, whoops, 260 twice. And so we interviewed them and asked them questions and had little uh, questionnaires we gave to them. So for the one question, information books in school are boring. Okay, how do students, do they agree? Do they think that's true of them or not? What do middle school students, these are seventh graders, what percentage of middle school students think information books are boring? 75? Real close. Real, I, we didn't need to do the survey. We just, could you give me your email? 75% um, say information books, and we define that for them as books they're going to learn something from in school, science books, history books, other books. Now, what percentage of students actually, that's an attitude boringness. What percentage actually start to do something, start to take action based on that attitude? What percentage are going to say, well, you know, I don't read these information books. They're boring and therefore I, I don't do it. What percent do you think say this? Seventh graders, straight mainstream, all the seventh graders in a district, kind of an average achieving district in the state of Maryland, Any ideas? What about your seventh graders? How many of them just really don't read too much? Information books. Any, any forecasters? Okay, make a small prediction. It doesn't have to be right. Expectation based on experience. Okay, I have a very high number offered here. Um, it scares me to even say that number. Is there another... Is, is there another Offering. Okay, 45. Okay, I have three numbers. I'm going to take the the closest the closest 45 percent of seventh graders, average achieving, and, and this is all the kids are saying. You know, here's what they're saying. I try to get out of reading information books for school. Another phrase we had in this same ballpark of. Of, of, of avoiding is, I think uh, information books are a waste of time. Can you imagine this? Our whole future is being determined by whether they can do this or not. And they're saying it's a waste of time. I try to get out of it. My friends and I plan on how we don't, we're not going to read. Now, that's not all the students. It's certainly not the top 20%. But this is, overall, we have... <clears throat> Terrifying pr proportions to say, uh, it's very true of me that I try to get out uh, of, of reading information books for school, or it's somewhat true, it's almost 50%. So the problem is, our educational challenges here are, are challenges for teaching this hard stuff. But there are also challenges for getting kids to believe it's important, to, to actually find interest in doing it, and to get energized to go in this direction. So this is what I'm saying. I'm saying we have dual challenges, a cognitive challenge and a motivational challenge. And, and <clears throat> so now let's look at a framework for thinking about that. If we're going to think about the outcome of reading uh, instruction, we're thinking about achievement. We're all being measured by achievement. Some of the ingredients are reasoning, literal understanding, fluency, vocabulary, uh, I don't need to repeat David and Freddie's ma magnificent messages about everything that goes on in the head. Th that is the, I'm saying, at this point in time, that's the outcome. <clears throat> How do we get there? Reading engagement. Reading engagement. Meaning, effort. Working hard at reading. Persistence. R getting through homework until it's actually done. Um, putting, in, uh, putting in the enthusiasm 
finding enthusiasm. Engagement's now referring to doing the reading, but doing it with interest, enthusiasm, and, and a, sense of, a sense of empowerment that, that reading can provide you when you're gaining knowledge that you like and value. So this is engagement. Now, okay, no student did two minutes of close reading and suddenly was a high achiever. Okay. There's a high time involvement here. This is deep engagement over long periods of time. That's where reading comes from. That's why the South Koreans are up there. They have very high engagement, more than three times typically what we have kids doing in school. So we want them to think about <clears throat> how do we get this thing to happen, this reading engagement. If a teacher stands in front of a classroom and gives 20 magnificent lessons, the kids aren't going to be achieving unless what? They've been engaged as a result of those lessons. The kids have, that's what powerful teachers are doing. They're fostering this engagement that's deep and long lasting, it's going on for a long time. So the two ingredients in this engagement are doing the things David and Freddie described to you. That is to say, doing the cognitive side, <clears throat> doing the fluency, the reasoning, the vocabulary learning, that, that, and using background knowledge in order to comprehend new text. These things must happen. At the same time, the other side of the coin is that the students need a, a collection of reasons to do it. Reasons to do it. Now you can turn the page for a second grader and help them turn the page. At, at fifth grade, they have to turn the page themselves. And in seventh grade, they have to bring the book to school <laughs> or find it. And you need them to be wanting to do these things. So we're looking at <clears throat> motivation and cognition as two sides of a coin. But now, which one do we spend our time planning? Which one do we spend our time assessing? Which one do we spend our time buying materials for? Which one? Cognition. But are both sides of those coins needed? Cognition is giving you the skill set. If you have the skill set and don't want to use it, what happens? You can't grow that skill set very well. And you can't go to the next grade very well. So you need both. Now, if you have the motivation but no tools, you can't grow either. So we need, in my opinion, my view is, we should be spending half of our time on the, on the other side, the flip side, the engagement side. It's half of it. Now, in a big study of 70 countries uh, that I, was, uh, I helped out with the reading measure, and we had questionnaires to students, a, a huge analysis showed this to be true. We had measures of how well they could think in order to read. We had measures of their motivation to read. And they were 50-50. They're equally important to fostering high achievement. So now, the good news is, there's a whole set of classroom practices that are shown to affect this thing of motivation. And I will be going over these a little bit more, but basically showing that the text is relevant to your life and your interests giving students choices in, in the nature of their reading, giving students a sense of success so they believe in themselves, helping students see the importance of this reading today for me, not like reading will help you when you're 70, um, and collaborating with others to make sense of text and finally assuring a very high volume. I'm gonna go into each of these, but these are the uh, basic ingredients of a classroom practices that are fostering this motivation and engagement. Now, what I want you to do is talk time. Look at, and I'm gonna bring the list back up, this, this model we're talking about. Talk to your partner and find one of these motivations. Look at one of these things, self-efficacy, which is confidence, value, which is believing in the importance, intrinsic, which is interest, and social, which is collaboration. Think about one of those reasons for reading that you think your students most need and will most benefit from by getting more and will most likely boost their reading engagement. Okay, so now back to the directional. 
you're looking at what, using that model, which motivation, which of those four things, and I know you may understand it only incompletely, um, is most urgently needed to build deep comprehension through extending engagement. Okay, now this is find a partner at your table, two minutes by my watch, and um, we'll look, look at what your answers are, okay? Using this model. One of those four motivations, which one is most important to students you know? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to ask you to wind down. I'm sure you've solved the engagement challenges of your school. Um, and I would like to draw your attention to the, um, the next steps. Now, first of all, I think it, it, was, it was a great buzz. I heard you really talking about it. How many people have talked to a professional colleague about motivation ever in her lifetime before? Some of you, all right. And we want and need more talk on what are the motivations that we need. I'm gonna move on and illustrate that. I'm now gonna present you a model we've designed. Assuming that that overall framework makes sense, and there's a mountain of research behind that framework for engagement development that I mentioned to you. We have a model that we have applied. I'm going to get a little bit specific, and then I'm going to talk about the general engagement practices in broader terms. This may be hard to read, and the point here is not to have you understand this whole unit, but this is a one-month unit that we taught seventh graders, all the seventh graders in the district, for four weeks in history, merging history, and literacy. Um, the, and the point here is to understand the frame we have, the overview. So the overview is what's the content? Causes of the Civil War. It's a unit on the Civil War. Big concepts. We identified the big concepts we wanted students to be learning. Economics, culture, slavery, politics in week one. Now they aren't going to be mastering those in week one. But those are initial targets. We're, what are we going to do to help students read the texts? So the next, uh, the next line is reading <clears throat> comprehension instruction, inferencing. So we spent time on inference, and I'm going to show you how we did it. What's the motivation? We are going to emphasize several motivations across this unit. We found that it helps teachers to focus on one at a time to get started. Then they can combine them, put them together, and have a more complete uh, provision. We're going to emphasize success. This is for seventh graders, because we found that w if seventh graders are given a really hard book, it, it takes them about 30 minutes to decide whether they're ever going to read it or not. And if they say not, yeah, they mean it. They won't do it. If they say they'll read it, you have a prayer of getting it opened, maybe not learned. But the point being, we wanted to give them a new experience with learning history from text. And we wanted them to think like this could be new and different. So we wanted to be sure that all of them succeeded on across a wide range, kids who are reading college level down to gra grade three in seventh grade. <clears throat> so our first goal was to avoid the failure and essentially the perception, this is too hard for me. Because with that perception, they close off their energy in reading. So that was our first week's primary motivational goal, although we did other things. And so we had a whole class text on grade leading, text for on grade st student reading, struggling reader text, and advanced reader text. These big ideas, economics, culture, slavery, and politics in the Civil War, big concepts are present in every, te in every text. And they're treated in different ways, with different complexities of text. Independent writing required of everyone. So <clears throat> that's what week one looked like. Week two was slightly shifting the main concepts, going to summarizing as a teaching strategy, using choice as a motivational support, again, with texts 
evolving, changing slightly. Week three, military issues, strategies, leadership, um, concept mapping taught, emphasis on importance taught. And this is the, the thing, reading is boring, it's a waste of time, I don't do it. Okay. We want to address that directly and last, the collaborative motivation support. So we have these concepts changing, we have the strategies changing, and we have the motivations shifting. So students are getting a broad diet over time. Um, illustrating to you, what does one week look like? Now, I'm, I guess you probably can see the basics, but not much. So again, for each week, for each, this is lesson one, week one, we have concepts, a video link. Now this is not to watch about history instead of reading about history, but it's to get kids primed and interested so <clears throat> they can get into text. Uh, the, so the, the video gets, and what we do is have students take notes, talk to their friends, write down what they learned from the video. And we try to get the inferencing going that we want them to be doing in reading. So they're watching a brief video, writing what they learned, talking about it, then reading about the same topic the video was on. So the video is seven minutes. It's not 40, it's seven. And then it's followed with text that is uh, very, very related, and then we're gonna ask inferencing questions out it so they can bring things they saw from the video into their understanding of the text and get to some, some um, successful reading comprehension. Um, and so, how, for success, we have a debriefing question. How did the video help you feel confident in your reading? What did the video do for your reading? Well, kids will scratch their heads, but then they'll say, oh, it gave me some information. It was interesting to see that man talking like that. And then I read about how he was talking. I understood how he was read because I saw how he talked about it. So the students now are connecting a piece of real world experience, watching a video to a piece of text within the same 15 minute period. So they're linking real life experience, watching a video is real life for them, and reading a text, and that's happening within the same short period of time. Uh, so that the purpose of the text is to prime the background knowledge, capture the interest, and help students feel like they can talk about this, they can write about the causes of the Civil War, and they can then move forward into text and do a similar thing. Um, so inferencing continues all week, getting more complex. The success support, now success also is being supported here. They're supporting their self-efficacy with the text by giving that te video background, which is interesting and knowledge generating. So we're enhancing the probability they're gonna get the text and do something productive with it with the video. So it's having a motivational effect and a cognitive effect at the same time. Um, I mean, I, I could go on. They are doing writing every day, uh, advanced reading. Now, for the advanced readers, I must tell you, we found the hardest text we could find for, in history. The hardest text short of a college textbook, and we gave them to students in the first year, and it was ridiculously too easy for the top 20%, and they ridiculed the program, actually. And so this became a pilot year because they made so much fun of the program, it, it, it didn't work. <clears throat> so we found Scientific American text, uh, Discover Magazine text, so, so high-level journals, excerpted the articles, simplified them as the smallest amount, put them in their own booklet, an enrichment book. And then the top 20% took off. They were challenged sufficiently. So this complexity of text has to be, be understood across the range. So our high students were being disengaged by not being challenged. And when we did challenge them, it, we had, we, we got these other processes to be going. Success, belief in themselves, collaboration were working if in fact we had uh, the challenge level right. Um, so these are the kind of topics that we have had for, for, very di for different kinds of units. Animal survival and ecosystems. So that's a conceptual theme for fifth graders. Um, 
plant and animal interdependencies, symbiosis, mutualisms. Th these are conceptual themes for fifth to seventh grade that we have used. I just want to help you understand what we mean by a, a big idea at the top. So students have a big idea that they're re reaching for for four weeks. Um, now, how do we get them to, <clears throat> to um, su succeed? Well, we have a science, so this is an example, very specific example, a day, week one, lesson two, in this history unit. Uh, so we have, a, in this case, I'm giving you a science example. It works the same. We have a, a four-week science unit, also a history unit. Students re observe the video, and they take notes. Students share their notes with a peer, and they write the new ideas they learned from the discussion. Then they discuss their ideas with the whole class, and the teacher posts two or three big ideas that they got from this video. So new knowledge is now being posted as a basis for their next learning activity. So then the teacher models inferencing using an inferencing guide. This is the kind of a book we had. This is the kind of inferencing guide we provided. Before inferencing, what does this sentence mean? It could be considered close reading. We're not to inferencing yet. We're just actually making the text, uh, the text structure. Make, first step of inferencing, making connections. And we get so specific as this, we'll say, read the first sentence, let's say what that means in different words. Now, sense, second sentence, say what that means in different words. Now, connect. How are the first sentence and the second sentence related to each other? Kids will have ideas about that. So now let's go to the third sentence. How is the second, third sentence and the second sentence related to each other? Take notes. So we, then we get students on, the, on one overhead, there are these sentences. And on another overhead, the teacher's writing the connections. And at the end of a seven sentence passage, we show the students, here's the passage, seven sentences. And here's your connections, 20 sentences. So where is meaning coming from? The meaning is coming more from me than it is from the text. The students are empowered and gaining a sense of they can do it by having this extremely basic sentence by sentence inferencing activity. And historians who were involved with this are saying, you know, they're not just learning reading there, they're learning history. So if you empower students to do a simple inferencing activity like that, they're making connections with characters, with plot, with big ideas that his, history people think is not just reading instruction anymore. It's content learning, which it is. So we are <clears throat> empowering them with those um, strategies and it, it, it gives them a sense of belief in themselves at the same time. So we then have some guided reading activity. I'm going to skip a little bit of this example to get to the basic processes um, uh, of instruction. So our first principle of instruction is assure success. Assure success. Now, that's got good cognitive reasons for doing it. But for students, read it's belief in themselves. Now, one, one way to assure success is providing texts that are readable. And regardless of what the Common Core says, yeah, don't start with an on-grade text for everybody because they won't get there. We all want to get to the goals of the Common Core, but we want to start where the students have a, 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 a foothold. Um, peer or teacher feedback. So assuring success for the purpose of uh, enabling students to see, I can do this. Uh, next, providing relevance, which is to say, how do I connect to this text? In elementary school, hands-on science activities are phenomenal. If you put a salamander on the desk of a fourth grader, you got his attention. Right? Okay, in, in high school, so in secondary school, videos are very powerful, and Discover Channel we would, are, are, is a very rich source of vi brief videos that take the student out of the classroom into a world they can look at, relook at, and then connect. And then, and then exp have text explaining video and video illuminating text. So it's one of the forms of making text relevant to students. Uh, this is a fifth grade class where some students had a horseshoe crab. 
can see the excitement here. One horseshoe crab in a unit on ecology, and a horseshoe crab, as you may know, is its own community. I mean, it's got parasites in there, and lots of good things happening, and barnacles on it. So it's a community. It's a walking community, and the kids can study that and go back to their books and, and learn. So choices. We suggest this is a crucial way in which students can take control of their learning. Who's in charge uh, if you have only direct instruction where the teacher gives a text, the teacher asks a question, the teacher gives a piece of paper to answer the question with, student answers the question alone. The teacher, if you're teaching, let's say, summarizing, and the students wrote a summary under direct instruction conditions, um, how many choices were there in there for the student? Zero. Most of the time, it's going to be zero. So many, many of the, and yet, having some input into what am I reading? What are the reasons I'm reading it for? What are the questions I'm answering? What are, how am I showing that I know things? These qualities are notably missing from good direct instruction. So what we would like to move toward is students being somewhat in charge of themselves as learners. And the best way to empower them with the feeling that they have some role in their own learning is giving small choices. And I would recommend every teacher could and should ask for each lesson, what choice am I giving my students today? Now, it doesn't have to be a choice of whether to, go to, whether to leave class. It's not a choice of let's go to the media center for the whole session. It's not a choice of oh, let's put the textbook on the shelf and forget that. Okay, those are not the choices. Many choices inside lesson activities can be provided and will, will in fact give students a little bit more investment in one page and a little bit more investment in each, in each activity. Uh, so here's a student and the choice they were given is you find the paragraph and draw an inference between two sentences in that paragraph and write it down. But this student is given the choice, which of three paragraphs do you want to choose? And which pairs of sentences do you want to choose? Now, does it matter the teacher which, which paragraph? Well, it could under some conditions, but not always. So this is a mini choice. She didn't have a choice to leave her, her desk, but she had a choice within the activity that empowered her to take take hold of it and make it her own. Very simple way. This is not turning school over to the kids, but this is it, giving them a little sense that they're in charge and, and they are in charge. Collaboration, we know about the power of social learning. And uh, we have kids reading in partners all the time, small groups all the time. One thing about collaboration and discussion of text is this, the point of it in my view, is to boost the reading engagement. So a 45-minute discussion over two pages of text with three minutes of reading hasn't been the right balance. It hasn't been the right balance because the, the, the time spent in collaborative work, in collaboration, should increase many-fold the time spent reading and thinking deeply, not take the place of it but in, enhance it. So it's true for all of these practices that in fact they should increase this volume of deep extended reading, not, not get in the way of it. Um, and so a field trip where you go to a nearby city and you spend the whole day out of school and come back and, and talk about for two minutes about how interesting it was may not foster engagement, you know, it may not be the way to get the kids to connect the outside world to their literature unless you've, unless you've engineered it. So, in fact, a, a field trip can engineer, can, you know, can launch a month of reading and writing if you set it up to do that. Or it can be really time off, it can be disengagement. Um, collaboration is extremely, uh, extremely potent and, and, can, and needs to be fostered. Importance. By importance, I use this term because this is teacher emphasizing how the text is contributing to you. Now, we found real quickly that we couldn't walk to seventh graders and say, okay, if you read, you will do very well in college later. And so it's important. 
Uh, this didn't seem to go over, actually. So what we did was give little experiences. So we had the students <clears throat> read something, work with a partner, and then those two people explain their paragraph to another, another group. So then we would ask the kids, what helped you explain? Well, what helped me explain was we took notes on it. What helped me explain was my partner had great ideas. You know, that's what helped made it work. Uh, what helped us, oh, we read, we read. That helped me explain. Oh, you, you, what did you read? The text. The, you read the text. Yeah, did that help you very much? Well, actually, come to think of it, I don't think we could have done it without that. They aren't conscious of the fact that the text is this huge repository that's empowering them to understand well enough to explain. And when they realize it is, when they can track their successful explanation, some classroom of event that worked for them, back to a text that they were able to unlock, they see the importance of reading. They can't say reading information book was a waste of time if it helped them explain really well. So this is what we mean, giving classroom experiences that empower the students to see the benefit of this literature interaction or text interaction for them now, not five years later or even 20 minutes later. It's got to be now. And so this is what we mean by emphasizing importance. Um, empower students to read a lot. Well, how much? I think, I think the, the problem that co core content standards are high order and complex, and we have to get kids to higher level complexity, is a smaller problem than the problem that our students are in, in the main, except for a high percentage, uh, except for 20%, disengaged from reading. And we have to make a sea change in the depth and amount of their engagement. So I think we need to boost the amount of reading they do in and out of school. Uh, and this is, and they won't do it with the teacher turning the page of every magazine and book. But they will do it if they have these reasons for reading. Self-confidence self from success experiences. A sense of empowerment and, uh, and being in charge from their choice and autonomy support experiences. A sense that it's important, even may not be interesting today, but it's important to read this and it will benefit me in the sense that I can do this with others. I'm in, I'm in a, a, a social group, I have partners, I have a team, and I can move forward. So if they have these reasons, they will engage in the high volume that we want them to be engaging in to build that expertise. Now, um, I'm going to wind down very quickly, and by that I mean 60 seconds. And so what I'm going to do is very simply show you this graph, which is in a journal, the Reading Research Quarterly, your beloved first choice in reading, uh, this month. And this graph shows the red had students had received our intervention in the first period of, 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 of this, uh, this eight-week time. So they, for four weeks, they were in our program, and they went from this level of comprehension up. And then they had traditional teaching by the same teachers, they went down. A little bit, not significantly. This, this other band is a band of students who had that controlled treatment, regular teaching as usual. Then they got our intervention in the second half. So we had, in the red line, it's one group of teachers who we trained to implement our program. And they implemented for four weeks and the kids go up. Then they shift over to their regular program, and the kids kind of go the same. The second group of teachers kept teaching their regular program, then they introduced ours. So what this is showing is that a group of 20 teachers can learn to do these engaging practices, and within a month, they can move their kids forward in complex text comprehension. And if they decide to do the teaching in the first month, the kids move up in the first month. If they decide to wait a month and do the teaching in the second month, that's when the students increase in difficult text comprehension. Now, I've just given you a three-sentence summary 
of a 30-page article in this journal. But it, it was a culmination of that, that grant where we had interviewed students. And the last thing I want to show you is this photo of a student uh, in fifth grade, the previous grant, fifth grader. I saw her, her, and I looked at her, and I wondered, is she intellectually challenged? It may be. You know, she was moody and hard to talk to. She was re withdrawn and a little bit scared. Look at her face. This is a, as a teacher, you worry about this child. This was before we in, began our intervention. In the middle of the intervention, here she was. Okay, so the frown turns to a smile. She's got a bow in her hair. She's got a pencil in her hand and a boy across the table. What can I say? <laughs> so the, the conclusion here is engagement is the, uh, the missing link in getting to the core content standards. We know the processes. These four motivations are a beginning set. There are more, but these are fundamental. Teachers can understand these and learn to make them happen more readily, more frequently in classrooms. And that one of the persons who is rewarded most is a teacher because the students are connected to their, their lives in school in new ways. And so, uh, and we have numbers huh, to illustrate that in fact this works for the kids. And when it works for the students, it's working for the principal and the district. Thank you very much.